and welcome to the Painter Bride Quarterly Slush Pile. So happy that you've decided to click on us and listen in as we discuss some poetry today by Danielle Roberts. So how this works is we discuss submissions just like we're having an editorial meeting, except you're listening in. So vote along uh, as you listen. And if you'd like to see the poems as we discuss them, they are on pbqmag.org. Uh, let's introduce the we. So we're still recording from home, even though the world is a much better place to get around in. And so I'm at my home in Collingswood, New Jersey, and I'm Kathleen Volkmiller. And I'm going to bounce it to Marion Wren in Abu Dhabi. And the bouncing ball is received here in Gulf Standard Time. I'm Marion Wren. I'm sitting here Slushers, you can't see this, but I'm showing everybody my cat sitting on a little Ikea oh. rug. And she, I she like keep, keep your camera, camera that way. I'll take a photo for social. Okay. So she loves, she loves to listen to the voices of the podcast. So she perches right here. And for those slushies who've like, you know, maybe been lifers with us early days, this cat was so like randomly talkative. She would just be like, wow. Terribly vocal, terribly and vocal, that cat. Now, like she's just mellowing out slightly, although she does occasionally sing. So with that, I'm going to bounce it over to Samantha. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Samantha Neukebauer, and I am in Baltimore. Um, my cats are not in the room, um, so I have nothing to show. Um, but uh, I will bounce it to Jason. Hi. Um, yeah, I think I've also mellowed since we started the podcast. <laughs> I've become, also become less vocal and just a little more chill. But yeah, I am in New York. And I also want to say we were Zooming from home before it was cool, um, yes. before the whole world shut down. We were the, we, all of us as um, hosts were like, oh, Zoom, we know that from Pain and Thrive <laughs> quarterly slush pile. That's true. I do enjoy saying that, that we were as we were with so many wonderful poets early adopters <laughs> right we knew that when everybody else was going zim, zoom, 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 zoom. we knew it so good yeah so talia we have to go to talia talia hi i'm talia thomas i'm here in philadelphia and i'm here to make sure everything sounds perfectly well and i'm excited to hear the poems so we're good. so happy to have you here with us. Thank you very much. You're actually on campus, aren't you? It looks like you are. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm on campus. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for being there. Yes, of course. Yeah. All right, wait a second. I back up for a minute. You look like you're in a basement. Are you in a basement somewhere from you? No, but the apartment's here. I'm in University Crossings. Oh. Uh, it seems like it a little bit. I'm going to be honest, but yeah, it's kind of almost like a bunk bed situation, like uh, sitting underneath the bed. Yeah. I thought I that was the ceiling. I was so confused. <laughs> yeah. That makes yeah. more sense. Yeah. So awesome. those of you who are picturing like a giant soundboard and, you know, <laughs> it's really is on <laughs> Because it's 2022 and that's how it goes. That's how you do it. Right? All right. Yeah, you're such a lifer with us. This is perfect. <laughs> it's the best. We've recorded from so many different places. So um, I mentioned her name already. I'm going to mention it again. We're going to read uh, some poems by Danielle Roberts. And um, very excited to do so. So excited. I haven't read on air in a really long time. Can Ooh. I start off? Please. Yeah. 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 Okay. And you know what? Like, I'm just saying gin cocktail is like my eye just ran to that. So I'm like, I think this one's for me. All right. I'm going to put myself on mute so I don't ooh and ah the whole time. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is the first poem we have today from Danielle Roberts. How can I leave this behind? And it it's after Jean, Jean Ann Verley's Helen Considers Leaving Troy. Okay. How can I leave this behind? After a floral gin cocktail, do I want to live and die my whole life here, buried in county lines? Or is it time to stretch the map? There's more to plan than simply running away. While holding my niece, picking up the baby doesn't help. I smell her hair and wonder if she thinks of me when I'm out of sight. Will she know? Her eyes stare into the distance along with mine, 
Maybe she travels in her dreams. Maybe she lives elsewhere while eating dinner. Gorging myself on routine, I chew bread and think about the bagels in New York. I live these sourdough rituals, oven baked in centuries of families. A young tradition bounded by water on all sides. They say it's in the water. Doubtful, I gnaw on my nails. When people ask if I'll have kids, Come on, Karen. I just blew up my life and you're asking if I'm ready to be a sacred vessel. The only answer I can give is to flee far away from anyone who had dreams for me or thought I could be marriage material. Go where all folks care about is which street I live above in the gridlocked graph or whether I'm walking fast enough. Blend. It would be easier than questions of barrenness. When my ex wants to get back together, absolutely not. From the freeway exit, behind the wheel of my car, I carve trenches again, circle and retrace my path, map the small universe on foot, pace my cage. Maybe I take to the night sky or simply head east until I hit water. Gorges and grooves heal, scarred cutting board life. Do I keep driving? Where do I even go from here? These dreams that weren't mine festering in my wake. What city takes such hazardous rot? How do I leave my family behind? How do I tell them I'm already gone? Boy, it was on mute going, great reading. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely. Couple stumbles there. So uh, while everybody's thinking, uh, slushies, if you're not looking at it, there's little italicized introductions that these are the thoughts Helen's having at all these different moments after a floral gin cocktail while holding my knees while eating dinner. I tried to change my voice a little bit, but you'll have to look at how this is set up on the page. Different. Yeah, so um, it's, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Kathy, because one of the um, attributes here too, slushies, is that um, Danielle included a hyperlink to the poem that she's in conversation with. And I'm, I was never, I had never heard of um, Jean Ann Burley's work, which is, you know, what a wonderful, you know, lucky me, I get to know it now. Um, so uh, the Helen considers leaving Troy is is really uh, a, a strong intertext here, and um, formally and and just in terms of the project, they're they're sort of kissing cousins. So we'll make sure to include include the hyperlink. I thought the structure worked really beautifully. Um, it kind of gave you occasion meditation occasion meditation occasion meditation um but in this like really sort of fun and satisfying way it never felt programmatic or um forced it really felt like a way to kind of like move through life and think about it I really love yeah. the rhetorical questions throughout it I was never sure when one was going to come again but it felt like any line maybe um could be a question so it made it me feel I was very present in this poem with the narrator. Yeah. And I, you know, just having a, a look at the Verlet poem, um, they are very close, right? But I think what Verlet is doing is actually in the voice of Helen, a sort of updating of the voice of Helen. And this seems like an updated Helen, but more of an analogy to Helen rather than Helen speaking, right? This is this is sort of using the um that that myth as a way of uh, commenting on uh, the speaker's reality rather than the speaker being Helen updated. And I, I love how lightly it wears the gravity um, when people ask if I'll have kids. Come on, Karen, I just blew up my life and you're asking if I'm ready to be a sacred vessel. Uh, I just love that. That was such a great moment of um, pushback that, you know, people sort of like are bringing in these expectations of you that are just so um, profound and sort of inconsequential for the person who's asking and incredibly consequential for the person being asked. And I felt like like in many places, um, 
that gravity was worn very lightly in such a way that we were very aware of it, but it was also quite funny. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. You know, I think you could you could do this badly, right? You could very easily be ham-handed, right, uh, with it. And I think that she walks a very careful line there of being funny, um, but still really staying in what could be Helen's contemporary mind, contemporary, you know, point of view. And I, and I also love that she keeps reminding us that it's Helen and it's now, right? Mm -hmm. The surprises of all the modernity through it, right? Um, when you're thinking about Helen of Troy. I enjoyed that too. I, I didn't really think that the speaker was also Helen. I thought that was just kind of like the structure that came from the other poem. Oh. And I kind of thought of the speaker as just being in her own life, but using the structure that had been created in the other poem. But, you know, I, I thought she was at least likening herself to Helen. You know, I just blew my life up and you're asking me to be a sacred vessel. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I Sam, think I think I interrupted you. Oh, no, I think, I think I'm thinking like Jason, like, or um, thinking of uh, what George Eliot does in Middle March, where she's like, there are so many Teresas throughout history, like St. Teresa's and Dorothea is just one of them. And so I think that she is just like a Helen of this time period. And I think the New York yeah. and the in the century, like really goes with that for me. I love that, like reminder of time passage, which I think you were getting at too, Kathy. Mm -hmm. So is the ex um, Paris or Agamemnon? Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, that's true. Who would ask for her back? Was it Agamemnon? Yeah. Agamemnon? No, it's right. not Agamemnon. Agamemnon's married to Clytemnestra. Right. Um, Menelaus, is it Menelaus? Mm -hmm. I think it's Menelaus, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Slushies, I have failed us all. <laughs> My <laughs> right. edition right. has collapsed. It, but that's all right. That's a, a form of defiance. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> I muddled my facts. I muddled my facts at you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I love this conversation because I think that's what um, I, the, uh, the gesture is using Helen as analogy, right? Which is so great. That's, it's so much more like Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses. Right then, it is like a, a, a sort of um, you know Hel Helen in modern times, right? It's it's more like the like the, the the myth comes in as a grid for the contemporary monologue, which is cool. Uh, it, it changes the contours of the final section. Um, Helen in the wheel of her car, like wherever it is she's going to or from, um, is pretty different if she's Helen. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing as Jason, basically, that I think people um, remember what happens vaguely. Um, they know that Helen, you know, either was kidnapped or left in her own volition, but the players, the names, they can sometimes get lost in it. So I think that it speaks to your grid pattern, Marion. Yeah. And that, and that, come on, Karen, right? Like Jason, that so reminds me of the wit in your poems, right? Some like the strong <laughs> declaration and turn that, excuse me, I see in some of yours. You know, maybe we should connect all these things. I know we've had conversations before about pop cultural references and how long this poem will last. I mean, here we are, right? Calling up Helen of Troy and then using something as contemporary as come on Karen is Karen, right? Certainly New York bagels are here to stay and other references are are fine, right? But um, uh, will Karen, will, will college students know Karen 20 years from now? And is that a problem? I think it's just a, a name such a, as, right? as well. Like if we don't know what a Karen is anymore, I, th I think it still works as, even if it were like, okay. come on, Jennifer, it just blew up my life or you just think it, Anastasia. It, right, right. I think it still works. Okay, right. So when people I mean the, ask, the hard cave with the k come on and Karen. Um, I mean the, the sound work is important, but right. I think it would work as well with without reference to Karen's circa 2020. Good. Good. 
And a lot of those things, you know, I mean, it's interesting like that um, 20th century stillness of time has kind of gone away that like all of the ways in which like those great books programs and sort of mythological groundings were supposed to sort of establish this permanence. Um, you know, I mean, that permanence was established in a particular moment and dissipates in a particular moment. And, you know, as, as we sort of have all these endless conversations about the reinvention of higher education, um, eh, that my, one of my favorite, all right, so I'll, I'll just say this one last thing about references and looking up. Um, no, it's the great. last letter in Elizabeth Bishop's collected letters is complaining about um, someone who wants to explain something in her poem. And she says the last time that someone explained something in her poem, I think it was like the Norton edition, they had an asterisk for port. And it was like the port where she grew up, like a body of water where ships dock. Mm -hmm. And the explanation for, if I remember correctly, um, students in Japan, was that port is a kind of wine that's fortified and aged. And then she says, if they can't look it up themselves, like, they shouldn't be in college. <laughs> right. True. True. And I, I know that we have to move on, but you're making me think about uh, when I had my really amazing, unforgettable trip to Abu Dhabi. Yeah. And Marion and I had 12 students from 12 different home countries uh, read several poems, but I'm thinking about one specifically where everyone's perspective on drinking coffee at an outdoor sidewalk cafe yeah. was vastly different but yeah. they still like were able to dig into the poem even though what that meant for them was drastically different for each person right so yeah. so I guess you know it depends on the strength of the work as a unit Right. That one. And word there's there. also there's a joy in that discovery. I mean, if this poem lasts 200 years and you're reconstructing what the 20th century was or the 21st century was like, um, there's always a lot of weird, fun surprises. Like, you know, right. when I'm reading things from the 1890s to the 1910s, like going back and figuring that stuff out is um, is part yeah. of the joy. Yeah. Well, OK. Then speaking of the joy and, and this is like, I think like Danielle Roberts, like sort of wink at the world of poetry too. It's not just Karen, it's the epigraph at the top, the dedication at the top, right? Yeah. Cut, cut the dedication. There's no way we know this is Helen of Troy. Right? Right. But she includes the dedication and the hyperlink, right? To a poem that I didn't, I don't know about. Like I, I, I know Karen more than I know this particular poem by Jane Ann Verlet, right? But thank goodness I now know both and I'm getting this sort of the powerful echo chamber of the two, the resonance between the two. And I'm, I hereby think I wanna reclaim echo chamber from the dustbin of political turmoil. Because <laughs> yeah. there's something well really powerful, right? Really, really powerful on that. And we wouldn't know it without the epigraph. So yeah. smart move. Should, should we vote? You yeah, I was thinking. I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Okay. One, the thumbs are out. One, okay, two, three. The thumbs are out. Woohoo! Yay! And it's <laughs> unanimous. Unanimous. She's right as we went to vote. I thought, yeah, yo, we are four today, which means we uh -oh. could possibly tie. Uh -oh. But that was not a tie. That was a slam dunk. Um, Jason, do you have time to read this before you leave us? Absolutely, yeah. Yay. Um, extracting memories. Speak to me in layered tongues of bitten snow, slow molars carved with frost collected in the valleys between your teeth. The scientist bores a core, plucks the long memory from each glacier. This meter holds your first bicycle ride. This, a bridal veil of volcanic ash from Pompeii. Six cylinders of centuries trespass the sterile air. Blink at the forgiving sun. Blink at the unforgiving sun. From the dentist's chair, you look up at the light and this persistent body shrinks, cracked with age and use. Our indestructible jaws crumble with heat, 
losing enameled eons to inaction, forgetting to stitch our gums with floss. It's far too late to mend our habits now. Best to preserve what we can. Each line, a thought pulled out of context, precious archive of time before tales. We transcribe the answers to our final test without any chance of knowing the questions. Hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So slushies, <clears throat> this is another one you gotta just go look at because it's uh, very wide lines at the top, drilling down to three, two, one word lines at the very bottom. Um, so <clears throat> um, Jason did a great job of trying to convey that uh, for us, but it's better for you to take a look if you can. And interesting that we did so much talking about references and hyperlinks. On this one, there is a little footnote the title again is Extracting Memories, and the footnote says Ice Cores and Climate Change, British Antarctic Survey. So I don't really even understand that footnote. But there's, I mean, I, I, I didn't really, I wouldn't know it from the footnote, but I do know that people who drill ice cores into Antarctica kind of pull up these like very, very long cylinders that like kind of, they come out of the ground as a kind of pole. And then, you know, in the same way that you can trace the layers, the rings of a tree inward to kind of trace history. Yeah. If you go downward, it's the layers of ice. So whatever sort of like sedimenting onto the ice is like going further and further down into okay. the earth and as you pull out those those um cylinders of ice you can check the amount of carbon in the air you can wow. do all these yeah. kinds of, of inferences as to what the atmosphere was like that um, when the when it was sedimented that's that's very cool so that works even more with the shape of it and and i was thinking the word extraction i think pretty much only of teeth right and we've got that tooth line in the valleys between your teeth. And this reminded me of so much what you just described, Jason, as well. When a tooth comes out and it's just shocking how much is down into your jaw, right? Yeah. Like that yeah, like, tooth is yeah. so much bigger than what we see. Um, and then no one tells you when your molars come out, there's gonna be a giant hole in your jaw. <laughs> and you're like, what is this closing up? And they're like, oh, it might, might not. You can hide things in it. You always <laughs> wanted to have a cyanide capsule with you. Now you have a place for it. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Um, was that too personal? Okay. <laughs> 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 was that like just me? Was Is that, that what like you do with like... your jaw hole? <laughs> <laughs> jaw hole. <laughs> Oh my god, why is jaw hole sound so gross? Because <laughs> it, it is. is. Jaw hole is gross. It is. That's pretty gross. There is no it way is. for jaw hole to be okay. <laughs> I don't think I like the footnote here as much as I like the, you know, the reference in the other poem. Because I think this one does feel a little bit um, like Nortini to me. Um, yeah. And I wish that there was a way that um, just ice core or something was was more integrated in it. Can you just yeah. explain that, Sam, just for a second, sure. what you mean by Nortini? Sure. So, sure. Um, you know, in my classes, we use the Norton reader and kind of what Jason was saying with Elizabeth Bishop, there are, uh, every poem almost has two footnotes to it. And it will be things like... Um, you know, a uh, corset, and then it will describe what a corset is. Um, and then what I think happens is a lot of my students, especially their first round, will submit poems with also footnotes. Oh, interesting. It's lovely. It's lovely. But that I, think so interesting. That, I think that's what this reminds me of. Um, because I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, it's not in conversation with a poem like the other one was. It's, mm. It feels more like I, I'm worried that the reader won't understand me. So uh, I am referencing this. Well, I, I thought I, it was I, in the poem. I don't think we need it. The scientist bores, um, sorry, the yeah. scientist bores a core, plucks the long memory from each glacier. This meter holds your first bicycle, right? Like I felt like it, it sort of explained it. 
in the poem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So wait a minute. Are you two at odds? Sam, are you saying that you like the footnote we- or the footnote is what makes it Nortney in a negative way? I'm saying I don't think it needs the footnote. So Same I'm as saying Jason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're in agreement. Yeah. 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 But um, I, I want to push that a little bit further too, because I, I want maybe somebody to help me with the analogy that's set up there too. Like on one hand, it's really great to think about like boring the ice cores and having a, a tooth yanked. Right. But also like, what, what, like, what, like, what, like I, I met, I, what is it? Ann Carson says like a metaphor, allows your mind to experience itself making a mistake, right? But I, I can't, I'm not, my mind's not experiencing anything with this. I'm getting an analogy, but not a revelation or a, yeah. I so. thought that it was like the earth is a body. And so that as you kind of have this scientific study in which you're oh. pulling these columns out of the ice, you're leaving behind holes, right? That like the whole reason the the extraction works is because it's undisturbed, but now you're disturbing it. And so yeah. that alters the body of the earth. And even though you can use it to trace what's happened, it leaves behind these holes in the same way that having a tooth extracted. Um, and, you know, and, and teeth are such a big part of our history, you know, the tooth fairy and losing our baby teeth and getting in our big teeth. And, you know, molar extraction is kind of um, a rite of adulthood or passage. Um, like if, to me, it felt like there was um, a very clear relationship between the body of the earth undergoing this process that leaves behind the holes that both traces a history but damages it, um, and the human body, you know, having a tooth extracted, and this thing that's been with you all this time is gone and it leaves behind holes. And that like, you know, the last thing that survives of people are bones and teeth. And if you see remains, mm-hmm. um, people see yeah. they're still there um, and they're not stitched together with gums, right? They're just um, there. And so th- so to me, that part of the poem was really seamless. I actually really enjoyed that part of the poem. Ah. And I feel like the footnote sort of pulled away from it a little bit. I didn't need the footnote. But I really okay. loved the poem and all the sibilants, like this, like all these S's. Yeah, yeah it was beautiful. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. I, I don't think my brain was closing in on the the um, DNA strand of the poem, which by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is a reference to Jason Schneiderman's reading of poems. The gravitational force that holds them together is a sort of like helix at the center of a poem. Jason, I think you put your finger on a helix. (laughs) Thank you very much. Slushies, we will link to the essay in the notes. Oh, thanks. Jason does have to go and I don't want to rush this conversation, but do you think we should rush the conversation? Sure. Our thumbs out. Okay. Get that, get those thumbs ready. Get them rocking. One, two, three, vote. Oh, look at that. Unanimous again. It's in. Woo woo. Two for two. Danielle Robert. Woo woo. Bye, we'll miss you. Bye. Sad you. I miss you already. Bye, don't go. Love you. Bye. <laughs> you know what I was thinking about? The, the, uh, just real quick. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Jason now that he's gone. No, I'm kidding. Totally kidding. But you know how we are sometimes uh, pedagogical, and we've mm-hmm. heard that high school instructors and college instructors uh, use the show. Yeah. Um, this is just a little thought. In fact, I wish Jason were here for it, but I listened to a, a podcast that is um, Sean Hayes and Jason Bateman and Will Arnett, and they have a fictional character who is Sean Hayes's cousin, Nancy. Mm. And whenever they say something they think might be too industry for uh, a non-industry person to understand, they'll go, could you explain that to cousin Nancy? Mm-hmm. Yeah just so cousin Nancy gets it. And, and that's what I was thinking. Like, you know, even very smart, avid readers, if you're not also a teacher, you might not have picked up on the Norton. Right. And Marion, you made a reference to Jason's essay and, and the metaphor, uh, oh, who yeah. you, you know, and and her. yeah. So we could kind of have a character that we go explain that to blank. Mm-hmm. I guess we should just be careful with the name, though. 
We don't want anybody to think we're insinuating that they <laughs> that they don't get it, right? But maybe like even in the notes, we can have little, little, little uh resources, a little little footnotes. We're excited. We're excited, page, you know, not every time, but when we're more pedagogical. Yeah. Slushies, what do you think? Would you like that? <laughs> Nominate some names of who we could <laughs> say. Very good. All right. Well. Listen, slushies, they're nodding. They're just not saying anything. I feel like that. I just threw that out there and nobody took it at all. Yes, yes. I think it's dead air. Happy. I'm thinking of names. I think it's I think it's a great idea. I think it's fun. I think we should explain it to my cat. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. But or we can let's consider that. Right? Like if you explain it to an animal who needs maybe some Ooh. explanation you know what my brother david listens to these and he talks all the time about what he actually learns there you go he, so we're yeah he's, he's an hvac engineer he's a yes. engineer never i mean he you know he dabbles in lots of things he's you know he's mostly a singer songwriter but he does write but he never took writing courses per se in college and i love it let's, well, let's explain it to david yeah, yeah. But okay. we have to say Kathy's brother David. We have to say Kathy's brother David. Needs okay, to- perfect. All okay. right, who's gonna read? Oh, Sam, I love when you read, but I think maybe Marion should read because we've been talking about the cat so much. Look at that! Bird. Oh my goodness, the cat. the cat! All right, I'm going in. I'm going in. Gotta do right. this one. Here we go. Ready? All right, hang on, Emya. You ready? You ready? Reassurance, reassurance by Danielle Roberts. One, my cat startles. And I tell her nothing bad is happening, but we both know that's a lie on a large enough scale. She hears the neighbor's doors slam, the child in the ceiling crying like an injured mouse. She knows footfalls on the landing lead to the uninvited, lead to us coaxing her to accept strangers in her home. She knows the rush of sirens down oak or shouts from the narrow park must mean something in the way, in the same way we all know that one thing always leads to another. She turns a pale eye towards me as if to say, just because it's not happening to me doesn't mean it's not happening. Two, as we wade into the cold mountain lake, my sister promises me nothing's going to touch your feet, maybe some grass or a fish, but I've never seen anything bad here. She lifts, she shifts the baby to her other hip and walks deeper. Her husband rose away from the widening rings of sunscreen filming the top of the swampy water, oil slick of caution. I know she loves me. Later, I scramble onto the inflatable raft and hold the baby and my breath. My sister stays rooted in the water, extracting the implanted leeches from between my toes, doesn't glance down at her own feet, not even once. Her husband saw the signposts on the shore and told no one. He thought they didn't apply anymore. He's never noticed anything in the waters. Three, my boss sends a message before an important meeting to ask if I can still lead in light of the news. I reassure him, yes, I'm in California. I'm not affected for now. In the crowded room, the men make small talk, but have nothing to say. Damn, damn, damn. Excellent reading. This might be my favorite poem. Yeah, tell me why. Tell me why. Say why. Oh, I mean, everything just resonates so much. It was one of those experiences where as I was reading it, I already couldn't wait to read it again. Yeah. You know, um, each section was so satisfying. Yeah. And then when it's over... I'm in awe of the brilliance of how they connect. So, yeah. I mean, my goodness, I saw, I saw the the stanza two with the sister and the water and the leeches and all that. I was absolutely there. And I, and I had fun with the cat, you know, Um, but, you know, then it, it turned into, you know, 
a quite serious thought just because it's not happening to me doesn't mean it's not happening. Love that. Right. Right. And that's, I think you just helped me see how all three pieces really fit together, right? Like the husband in the second stanza, right? Suffers from the belief that, well, it couldn't possibly be happening because it's not happening to me. I never saw anything in the water, right? And then, right. The, and then the third stanza too is that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that that's a 9-11 reference, right? Um, but it could be anything, like anything catastrophic on the East Coast is slow coming to the West Coast, even though that's almost not true anymore, the way that news happens simultaneously across the nation. But um, yeah, it just weird, it weirdly like, you know, if you're far away from the catastrophe, is it happening to you? Do you still have this, the wherewithal to host a, a meeting? You know, is a really interesting sort of spiral back into the other two stances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, sadly, I don't know what that news is because the four now makes me think it's not 9-11, right? But, but it's, I mean, it, 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 that's sad that we don't know what disaster it, it is, um, right. but it doesn't matter either, right? That's and exactly right. Time. I yeah. love that. I love the second stanza in in the first section. Um, I love that the child um, in the in the ceiling crying like an injured mouse. Um, yes. I think that's wonderful. Um, but I do feel like in that first stanza, it seems like something that is happening around the narrator. So that's that's where I'm a little confused um, because then it it does seem like in the third stanza, it's something happening elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I, guess I think the they're very episode. separate moments. I'm sorry, oh, okay. Marianne. Yeah, I think they're totally separate because oh, okay. obviously the first stanza, she's in her apartment in a major city. Mm -hmm. Second stanza, she's in the water. And third stanza, she's at work. Hmm. Right. So I, I didn't. Remember. Okay, yeah. I think I was reading them as the same incident somehow. Right. Oh, oh I see. Yeah, no, I, you know what, Samantha, I think it's the, the three different scenes juxtaposed, but okay. it's the, the theme that's the through line or this predicament yeah. of, of things happening, but it just because right. you can't see it doesn't mean they're not happening, which, you know, I know we're often um, debating, talking about a batch of poems or a single poems, but the luck of being able to read three poems by Danielle Roberts, I can't, I'm really charmed by the way her mind works in, in analogy and juxtaposition, right? Like I can, I, it, it feels like that's a, a thinking move that's um, essential for the way this poet works. Sorry, sound of thinking, so she's- <laughs> Total sound of thinking. We're so looking let me, and let me thinking. This, so I, look, when I looked at the first stanza, I was a little like, oh, you know, um, what's that Suzanne Vega song? My name is, mm -mm, I live on the second floor. Uh -huh. My name is Luca. My name is Luca. Luca right? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I couldn't think of Luca. <laughs> but that, I, I was a little bit like, oh no, where are we, is, is that the terrain, you know, sort of like, this, this is terrible that I'm presenting this like a cliche, but abuse through the wall, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um. now i um, but the fact that she swings back to the cat and locates the, like the genius in the cat, right? And then that's the very thing that is like reading the scene of the second stanza, right? Without like, you know, driving the point home. And then the pared down third stanza, it's, it's almost like haiku length, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely like tied to the same sensibility of like offstage catastrophe and engagement with offstage catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was worried with all the love in the world towards cats. The mm -hmm. first stanza, you know, had me a little worried that it was going to be too gimmicky or, you know, cutesy projecting too much onto the cat. Mm 
but I thought it redeemed itself. The child crying, I never, I didn't think of abuse at all. I just thought that that's what, it's, it's something about in the ceiling, like Sam pointed, I love that line, that that's what it would be like for the cat. She doesn't think about the upstairs apartment. Wow. The sound yeah. just comes from up there, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just thought it was city sounds, sounds of living in this um whatever environment she's in. Kath, you're, you're reminding me a tiny little anecdote and then back to the poem. But when I first moved to Abu Dhabi, I lived in a building and the, the apartment right above me um, was a couple and they had a, a son who was like maybe five years old, six years old, but then the wife had triplets, right? So the, they converted their living room to a, a big, ba- ba- like the baby's room for triplets, right? But I didn't know any of that. I just looked be- beneath them and it was constant baby crying right and I'm like I remember that for you I remember that like all I hear is a child wailing I'm like this shit's haunted and then I I, then I met my neighbors But like these are three children wailing. This right is- <laughs> there's like hand in the whale to each other like they're in a sort of relay race right like one's fine the other one goes right you know I'm like oh my lord yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, the second stance, as I said, I feel like it's such an interesting intimacy too. like, especially if you don't actually know your neighbors too well, but you know, their sounds and you know, their cries and these kind of things. It's, it's very interesting. Oh my goodness. Wow. I can't believe how we're like blowing through them in a way, you know, like I, I, I am wondering if we're already ready to vote or if we want to keep talking. How about, you know, what isn't made any mention of that I thought, oh my gosh, like once she, it's, I'm so surprised and, uh, and like, you know, push away from the leeches between the toes, my <laughs> God, right? Yeah. But the sister, Marion, you pointed out the brother, the husband mm-hmm. says it's not happening because it's not happening to me. Her sister's the same. I've never seen anything bad up here. And she's holding her baby in the water. Yeah. And going deeper into the water, holding her baby. That's how much uh, confidence and bravado she has, right? Like, yeah. so sure that nothing is right. going to happen. She's right. got her baby in the water. Do you know what's so funny about that, though? Like, I just read the, I had this whole other story for the wife, too, that she was like, oh, fuck, I'm not going to look at my toes because I just want to deal with my sister's pain and not deal with my own because I'm probably like crawling with leeches too. I'm just not going to look at that right now. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> One of us at a time. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. KVM. Oh, I said that I can really just see all of it. Right. She's on the raft and there's, and holding the baby now so that the mom sister <laughs> can remove the leeches. Oish. Yeah, you learn so much about their relationship with that line, right? I love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know she loves me. It's like her with the cat, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and our speaker here does, you know, at the end too. Yep, I can do it. I've got it. I'm in California. I can lead the meeting. Yep. You guys ready to vote? Stands out and comes together. Yes, I'm ready. Same. All right. All right. Here we go. Now we are three. So there can't be a tie. Trying to build up the dramatic tension. Attention. All right. One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> Marion won't show her thumb. I'm just making you wait. <laughs> <laughs> and more dramatic tension. <laughs> And it's it as well. A trifecta for Danielle Roberts. Danielle. Go, Danielle. Woo. woo. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting us discuss your work and, uh, and publish it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Any, Benny, have anything else to say? Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Talia, for being here. Thank you, Slushies, for tuning in. Uh, let us know how we're doing. Much thanks to Daniel Roberts and everybody else who submits to PBQ. And uh, keep reading. Woohoo! Bye. Bye.